Um, so it's okay. my great pleasure to introduce uh, Elisa Satyukov, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Leipzig. Um, she's worked a lot on actually memory of the NATO intervention in 1999 in Serbia. Um, but today she's going to be presenting something quite different, um, namely looking at in a certain way, well, I guess, knowledge production and how, uh, especially in the German academic area, one is thinking and teaching uh, Southeastern Europe. So this is, I think, something which, of course, for a Center for Southeast European Studies is of particular interest and relevance. Um, so we're very much looking forward, to, Lisa, to your uh, to your reflections and your thoughts on the topic, and also to a discussion. So uh, without further ado, I'll give you the floor, and then afterwards we'll we'll have a sure, very interesting conversation. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. I just I was just saying that I was hoping to come to Graz personally, but over here it's so hot out there. I'm <laughs> quite glad to be here in Leipzig with only 20 degrees. Um, so and I'm looking forward to talk to you for the first time, actually, um, about my new research topic, or I'm uh, about to start now. And this is uh, why I'm yeah very excited and I'm very much looking forward to your comments. And um, before I'm going to start, I would like to um, invite you uh, to a book talk I'm giving on, on Thursday. And um, this is a, a conference week for me this week uh, about uh, my PhD topic, Florian Bieber was mentioning about the 99 NATO intervention of Serbia uh, at the branch of the Southeast European Association in Halle, but of course virtually, um, but unfortunately it is in German, but uh, for all who are interested in the topic, there will be a special issue upcoming on the topic of the 99 NATO intervention in the comparative Southeast European Southeast European Studies Journal, that's a new title, and the beginning of next week. So um, yeah, stay tuned. Um, what are we going to do today? I would like to introduce you to uh, four different topics connected to, to, to my talk. I would like to start with some personal reflections about teaching the history of Eastern and Southeastern Europe. I would like then to give you a little overview about the structural and theoretical challenges I I see of researching the history of Eastern Southeastern Europe in German speaking academia. Um, and then I would like to give you an outline of my research project, of my postdoc research project. And at the end, I uh, would like to um, share with you some reflections uh, on the idea of decolonizing the history of Eastern Southeastern Europe as a collaborative project. Um, yeah, uh, thinking about Anka Pavalescu's conceptual framework of Eastern Europe as method. I'm sorry, I'm a little, I caught a cold, so I'm a little sick <laughs> today, but I hope it will work. Um, okay, let me start. So um, I teach mainly undergraduate students at Leipzig University at the historical department. Since the Bologna process, we don't have a, a specialization in Eastern or Southeastern Europe anymore. So it's basically students um, from different dis disciplines, but mainly historians, and most of them are becoming uh, teachers, school teachers. And um, uh, if I start, so they're coming to, to ask to our uh, professorship for Eastern Southeast European history, basically for one module or two, learning about the, 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 the region. So so um, I start my courses mostly with the question, um, what do we mean actually if we speak about Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe? Um, and as students are, they are a little overwhelmed looking at me and wondering, okay, what, what, what does she mean? What, what, should, what is Southeastern Europe? And at some point they come up with, uh, yeah, a region, we think so, and then they are doing some more brainstorming and um, and most probably they will uh, think about, when <laughs> they think about history, about Stalin and World War II, because this is what they uh, learn in school. And, um, uh, and uh, since we are here in Eastern Germany, they uh, have some knowledge about uh, perestroika, they know about Putin, of course, they bring their, uh, of course, useful everyday knowledge about pop culture, pop culture, food or traveling. If I ask further about Southeastern Europe or the history of the Balkans, they know 
mostly nothing. And if they know something, it's about the breakdown of Yugoslavia and the war of the 90s. But since I'm getting older and uh, students are getting younger and they're born in the middle of the 90s, they, um, they don't even know about the, the wars and the long or, or some of them. So this is where we started. And then I ask further, so, but what do you think, who or what belongs then to Southeastern or Eastern Europe? Um, and as they are trained as historians or to become historians, of course, they will look for a map and most probably they come with a map looking like this, like basically the Cold War version of, of Eastern Europe. So everything east from Germany is Eastern Europe um, or even from a GDR, a GDR say, or Eastern Germany now is Eastern Europe. And um, if we are asking about Southeastern Europe, they are very sure about the Balkan Peninsula and not so sure about uh, Turkey, Cyprus, or Moldova, or whatever Southeast European Association also counts to Southeastern Europe. Um, and uh, if we are looking at the at a, um, historical map, uh, maybe from the uh, age of the empire, so um, the question what or who belongs to Eastern Southeastern Europe looks very different uh, anyway. So we are having a look at um, the different students manual, which exists for the history of Eastern Southeast Europe, and um, this is one of them uh, with a focus on East Central Europe and Southeastern Europe. There's another one. Um, there's a part two um, looking at the history of uh, the, the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. Um, there's only one um, uh, about the history of Southeastern Europe and it's from Karl Kasa, you all know in Graz. And um, I think the most popular one is uh, this one, it's introduction in East European history. Um, they all are about 10, 15 years old, I have to say. And this one is basically including all the regions I was mentioning earlier into Eastern, uh, East European history. So. Um, yeah, students are then a little confused and asking, okay, because when you are not so sure what is Eastern Europe or Southeastern Europe, why should we have to learn then about Southeastern Europe? Um, and this is basically my uh, Maria Todorova moment. Um, I'm very thankful for the person who shared this pic on Twitter. Unfortunately, I don't have her phone number. So I, uh, I usually answer these questions to the student with, Studying the history of Eastern and Southeastern Europe basically means studying the history of Southeast European studies. And this therefore means studying the history of area studies in general. So it is complex. And especially with the history of area studies, which is a, a story of a constant death and revival. And um, I can't go into detail with area studies, but I would like to bring some light to the history of Southeast European studies here. Um, and I therefore would like to show you a slide by uh, Ulf Brunbauer. He was showing at a talk uh, workshop recently on Southeast European studies, a state of the art in Germany, Italy, and Croatia. And he was basically summing it up. I think <laughs> this uh, goes to the point as a very long and problematic tradition. So the Southeast European studies are always or were always since the implementation connected to certain political interests and they're very much con connected to the to the Nazi times and we have this uh, great book by Wolfgang Höpken who was published only a couple of months ago about the history of Southeast European studies until the 1990s and um, uh, what we are uh, seeing is that only after the end of the Cold War, um, there uh, started uh, like a huge debate about how to deal with the past and it's continuing until today. And what shall we do with the future of South and East, uh, Southeast European studies and East European studies at all? And I think there are two different directions in this conversation. So there are the certain structural challenges after a especially for the former socialist countries and the, um, and the implementation of a new uh, system in higher education, new, uh, uh, new study programs and so on. Um, and there, is, uh, there are certain theoretical challenges. Um, let me start with the structural. 
So this is uh, basically how our um, how our department of history looks like, and I think it looks very similar, like most of other departments of history in German-speaking countries or universities. So it's basically departed in different uh, uh, units, um, and uh, it's organized in a periodical manner. So we are starting with ancient history, and it goes all the way until the modern history, 20th century, uh, 21st century history. Usually there is some local focus, like we have here in Saxon history, um, there's the economic history, and then uh, we are here like uh, the only focus on like border areas, so to say, this is Eastern Southeastern Europe. Um, there was a focus on Latin America history um, until I think two years ago, but it was cut it out. Um, and um, so uh, I would like to quote here Jörg Baborowski and um, all these uh, discussions there were in the 90s, um, why we then need uh, East and South European history as a mere appendix of his historical studies. So why um, are we doing basically everything? So from the Middle Ages until nowadays, for at least for my uh, subject for uh, the history of basically three continents, why everyone else is like uh, looking more at the periodical orientation and having like different uh, regional um, focuses. So this question isn't solve we won't solve it but there uh, if we look at the development of the southeast european studies um since uh 90 since the beginning of the 90s i couldn't find um uh, 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 data which is uh, more which is um more current but this is uh, one evaluation by holm sundhausen at the beginning of 2000 uh, looking at 59 german universities and how the teaching related to southeastern europe has been done there and he comes up with the result that it's mostly done in history and slavic studies i would say it's basically um the same nowadays and it's based it's focused on uh, on a bunch of uh, universities i don't don't think we are sticking with 19 universities anymore, but uh, we would need a newer data to confirm. But uh, now to quote again, like this uh, um, presentation of Ulf Brunbauer uh, and the website Kleine Fächer, like small subjects, we see um, Southeast European studies. There are uh, for Germany, there's Bochum, Jena, Leipzig and Regensburg and a few more professorships. Of course, we have uh, like different institutes dealing with German minorities in Eastern Southeastern Europe, but they are mostly not uh, not involved in teaching. So uh, you are familiar with this picture because you are uh, Graz was uh, involved in this uh, event a couple of months ago about uh, master studies in uh, Southeast European studies. So basically, you can go if you want to uh, want to have a specialization. You can go like to Graz, to uh, Röde Gegensburg, Munich, or you can go to Jena. And I'm not so sure how long the Jena way will continue, but this is basically it for now. So um, let me come to the theoretical challenges then. So as we, as you all know, in humanities and social sciences, we are always dealing with different turns and looking at uh, uh, our histories from different uh, angles. And I would say East and Southeast European history was kind of a pioneer with the latest turn, the post-colonial turn, um, already at the beginning of the, middle of the 90s, um, uh, uh, coming up with all these discussions about mental maps and the Western gaze and Western hegemonic uh, view on different world areas. And there was, of course, you know, Larry Wolf and his inventing Eastern Europe. And um, for the Balkans, you are familiar, there was Maria Todorova in 1997 and her book, Imagining the Balkans. Um, I have to do it. Oh. So, and then something very interesting, at least from the perspective, uh, perspective of a historian happened, um, there was a debate because historians in, in, in the German speaking countries weren't so, weren't challenged by her idea of the Balkanism, of the Balkan as the, as the inada of the West. And, um, and so there was the debate, we are teaching students nowadays as the Sundhausen Todorov debate and Holm Sundhausen was a distinguished uh, historian of Southeastern Europe at the Free University in Berlin, and he was uh, basically 
saying that um, the Balkan uh, must be studied as a historical region uh, defined by a, a cluster of common characteristics. And um, if we look at the further development, I think you can one can say that this uh, Sundhausen school kind of won the debate because ever since uh, we are looking at the region as a historical region, as it was introduced by historical Miso region by Stefan Tröbst, um, or lately by our colleagues from Regensburg, um, uh, Buchrenner and uh, Brunnbauer as a, a space of interaction. And of course, we are, uh, we are uh, researching the region and his uh, relations to other regions as global history, entangled history, and so on. And uh, this is something um, very interesting. And now I would like to come back to the book of Wolfgang Höpken, because what he is saying is basically that after 1989, there was no process of self-reflection of the whole um, uh, involvement of Southeast European studies in its, in its different um, political connections, problematic connections, but rather there was uh, efforts of a theoretical self-assurance. So um, they blocked the self-criticism rather than encouraging it, and instead of it, they tried to, uh, to scientificate their own uh, area studies. Um, and only recently this process started, as I showed you. So I think um, this is, this is an interesting takeaway and uh, this is where uh, uh, we are at the very moment and the whole post-colonial turn then somehow seemed to get uh, failed away at least for the southeast European history and it was more discussion in the global history or the holocaust history as by Jürgen Zimmerer or in the imperial history so far and um, now we have a lot of conversation about decolonizing eastern Europe and southeastern Europe but we almost have no discussion in East European history, in German-speaking academia, or in German at least, um, at the very moment. Um, and of course, this is uh, changing uh, or will change in the, in the next years. So this is basically where I would like to start with my research project, which looks at the learning and unlearning of the history of Eastern and Southeastern Europe, and especially focus on the question of knowledge transfer here. So I would like to look <laughs> I forgot to <laughs> one word. Eric. So anyway, uh, how and under what conditions was research and teaching in the history of East and Southwest Europe been implemented and evolved in German speaking academia, which thematic focuses, theoretical methodolo methodological approaches, as well as didactic considerations have been guiding in the production and transfer of knowledge on the history of East and Southeastern Europe. How did this influence the general understanding and how could a future curriculum in East and Southeast European look like? And um, I would like to start my research basically in the classroom because I think this is uh, the place where, where, where you can have a look at all these different interactions from knowledge production and knowledge transfer. And in the, when you have a look at the professors, at the staff, at the students, and um, the all different connections to universities, um, uh, to universities abroad, um, uh, as well to the regions which are uh, studied by the, by the professors, um, but also which kind of knowledge was then implemented in the curriculum, in the syllabi, and so on. And also to have a look um, which kind of knowledge then transfer to the outside world. And especially when you have in mind that they are uh, becoming school teachers. So which kind of knowledge uh, uh, then went further to the schools, but also we understand the classroom as a room uh, of um, further multiplicators. So what kind of uh, knowledge then was implemented in a wider society? And I, of course, this sounds very broad, but what I would like to look at is um, first, uh, um, I would like to have a look at the university archives of what we now see are like the main centers of uh, Southeastern European history and Eastern European history. That's why I hope to come to Graz as well uh, and look at personal archives as well and study the study programs, curricular course catalogs and syllabi, as well as the academic output of professors and students, correspondence, uh, look at a list of guest research conferences and events as well, especially for 
for the teaching, I would like to have a look at the, uh, if there are recordings, notes, or concepts of teaching. So, and of course, for the later, for the, for the newer time, I would like to have interviews with staff and students. So um, this is it for my research project. Um, I think this can, this is, is, is I, I consider this part of a larger collaborative, a coll a collaborative project to decolonize Southeastern Europe, uh, which is um, starting at the, or is ongoing um, at the very moment. And, um, and therefore I would like to uh, engage with this concept of Eastern Europe as a method formulated by Ang. Pavulescu in a paper last year and basically she is uh, saying what um, what I was saying at the very beginning so um, to study Eastern Europe is thus to attempt to write a phrase out of existence to work towards its erasure but since the pro project cannot be achieved overnight the question becomes what do we do in the meantime so and she gives different answers to that, she proposes critical uses of East and Eastern Europe uh, as a scale, as a critical regionalism, as an object of comparatist attention uh, from the view of the emigre scholar or, as I said, as a method. And what does she mean when she says method? So she's borrowing basically this frame uh, from Kuang Sing Chen, Asia as a method from 2010, and saying it's a um, decolonizing methodology and a gesture towards collaboration. Um, so it's an invitation for the Polish scholar to collaborate with the Bulgarian or Hungarian scholar without Paris, Vienna, or New York as mediators. Um, so she's basically proposing for us as researchers of Eastern Southeastern Europe, um, not only to think with whom we collaborate, but also whom we quote in our journals and for us as teachers, whom we include, uh, who we include in our in our course programs. And so on. So um, this should be one effort. Um, uh, what is very much connected to this effort is the term Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe. And um, I was bringing this in the beginning and I'm thinking of this a lot because basically if you look at every, stu every uh, study manual uh, to the history of Southeastern Europe or Eastern Europe, it starts with a, like two page reflection on the term and if we now call it Eastern Europe, East Europe, Southeastern Europe, Balkans, West Balkans, or Osteuropa or in, now in German, in German academic speech we are now mainly saying östliches Europa and Anka Pavelesco is saying okay like Eastern Europe like uh, has an attribute is, uh, is, uh, is, 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 uh, is not the right way to go and she's proposing the term East Europe. Um, a colleague of mine was coming up with the idea of Eastern Europe but I'm not so sure if this is feasible. So what I think is, and I just uh, would like to, um, to, to get on this idea of uh, Anka Pavalescu, um, that we just coming to terms with this term Eastern Europe and uh, kind of uh, and, 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 and implement it as a social, political and critical positioning against the ideological and historical frame of East and Southeast European studies. So like in the same manner, we are using now gay or black uh, in capital letters or for the first letter um, uh, as a symbol of an emancipatory practice and or a gesture of solidarity. So this is one thing to think about. Um, then uh, I uh, think what bothers me now very much is the question, how do we bridge then the gap between knowledge production? We can decolonize our own ways we are researching Southeastern Europe, but how we can then uh, 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 import these ideas also uh, in, in the classrooms and uh, in this project of knowledge transfer, which is very important, I think. Um, and here, I think we are facing a huge language prob pro uh, problem, and especially in history, because um, as we see for, for, for natural sciences, so um, uh, this is uh, German articles are almost irrelevant, and I think the same holds true for, uh, for the humanities more and more. And since we are an we are an interdis working interdisciplinary and having an international focus anyway, so most research is published in English. 
but what we are doing in the teaching here is uh, is mostly German, um, and this is um, this is if we are bringing back like this classroom situation, um, this is something very important somehow because students are coming right out of school and they don't come here with very good knowledge of English anyway, and especially of it, not of the knowledge of an English of sciences. So this is all new to them. And then all the whole history of Eastern service in Europe is new to them. And this is not an environment where they um, where we start learning. And um, also, so this is the one side to think about an, a language which is appropriate to the learning situation. And it's the same situation if you go out and have a talk here at the, at the museum and people from Leipzig are coming and you talk about Eastern Europe and you do it in English. So you will have a certain public and it most probably won't be like the, I don't know, um, uh, whoever doesn't have a very a good knowledge of English. And this is still a lot of people, at least here. Um, and it's also um, a problem um, if, uh, let me, let, let, let us do it this, later in the discussion. So I can't solve this problem for, for the language and history. We are also very old fashioned. So uh, my professor said to me when I was thinking in which language I'm doing, I write my PhD was saying, okay, we have a tradition of a German speaking Southeast European studies. So of course uh, you write in English, uh, in German, and now I'm facing the situation that no one is uh, kind of gonna read my um, PhD because it's in German or only a very few people. So this is in transition also. Um, what I would like to propose then is to bring in um, higher education studies here, because as I said, it's not possible for students to understand like this uh, very complex history of Eastern Southeastern Europe. And I think I, they don't have to, we are not talking master students here, but um, what we can do, and this is very connected to this term of um, empowerment also to implement Eastern Europe basically as a tool or as they call it in higher education studies as a threshold concept. So what does this mean, um, Maya and Land, considering threshold concept as conceptual gateways or portals that lead to a previously inaccessible and initially perhaps troublesome way of thinking about something. A new way of understanding, interpreting or viewing something might thus emerge or transform internal view of subject matter, subject landscape, or even the world view. So um, rather than, uh, as I said, learning like every every date in the last, uh, from the East European history from the last 500 years, they should go out of the classroom and think of Eastern Europe as this kind of threshold, a way, a tool to uh, study historical regions. And um, and uh, uh, like the most popular concept of these, uh, of, of these thresholds are gender, for example. So if you want, once learn about the differentiation about gender and sex, you want won't, you will have a different view on, 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 on studying history. So this is uh, what I think we should, we should think of Eastern Europe as well. And this is, um, and I think where we should start is the classroom because I think teaching matters a lot. And um, uh, if we um, here would like to end with a quote by, uh, by Kubra Gimishai uh, and her uh, book published last year, Sprache and Sein. And she's basically saying, we need these places where we can think not to demonstrate how great we are and how much we know, but how much we don't know, but want to discuss. We need places where we can try out the future where we can practice a new way of speaking doubtfully, thoughtfully, questioningly, sometimes loudly, sometimes quietly, and always with good will. And I think uh, the classrooms could be these kind of places. And um, I would very much like to invite you to um, continue in this discussion. We are just uh, um, implemented a reading group on Southeast European studies in German speaking academia. So uh, we are happy if you would like to follow us. And of course, we uh, are having uh, uh, this Exner colloquium uh, uh, in October and, um, uh, and you are all invited to join for the public discussions then as well. So thanks a lot. Uh, and I'm looking forward for our talk. Great, great, Lisa. Thank you so much for, for sharing this, uh, I guess, first steps of the research project, but also I think 
uh, I think a, you know a very a very uh, good overview and debate on this topic. So so I think uh, I, I'm very excited about what you're planning to do and uh, very glad to contribute uh, to that. Um, so I think we have Sophia who would like to ask a question. So why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Anybody else can also. Um, or was it just the applause? Or was it did I? <laughs> it it was just applause, but um... but then you might as well ask a question if you're already <laughs> applauding, right? <laughs> Okay, um, but uh, so anyhow, anybody is welcome to ask their questions. So just raise your hand, or you can just turn on your microphone. Um, so maybe to just kick us off, I mean, how much? Because this debate about, I mean, it's it's fascinating. The debate about how to call Southeastern Europe or Eastern Europe is a very German debate. It strikes me um, uh, that, that you know the Anglo Anglo American academia. It's a lot more pragmatic about how to call it, or you call it in all kinds of different ways, and. And I'm always wondering how much it's a useful debate. I mean, it's a useful debate, I think, in, the, in what you were saying, uh, in being self-reflective about what the categories one uses. Um, and I think that's a useful, uh, you know, it's healthy for any research. I mean, of course, you know, you can have endless debates. When, when does Zeitgeschichte begin or contemporary history? Or when does, you know, many of these categorization, all of them are, of course, arbitrary to some degree. So it's not that, it's not that Eastern Europe is, an, is, is arbitrary, but, contemporary history isn't, or medieval history isn't, or European history isn't, or, you know, so in that sense, all of them are, are, are arbitrary categories, some more so than others maybe, but I'm not even sure that Eastern Europe is, I mean, it's arbitrary if you want to study through all historical periods, but there are certain historical periods where it might make a lot of sense. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, uh, I guess, how much you're also bringing in the non, I mean, I know your project is about German language academia, but I'm just kind of wondering how much you're having a comparative angle to, to what you what you want to look at and, and how to bring in those other experiences, which I guess it's predominantly the predominantly neighboring countries. I mean, Russia probably has a good tradition as well, as well as uh, maybe, I mean, but I'm mostly thinking of the, the British and American approach, which is, you know, has also grounded in different experiences and so on. So I'm just curious to hear about what your take is. Yeah, this is basically still in the making. So um, yeah, I'm not so sure if I'm, I think I, I'm going to start with the German speaking um, academia because this is where I am at the moment. And this is also under the Corona circumstances somehow <laughs> feasible to do. But I think I uh, would like to have, of course, uh, um, to include the UK, UK and US. So as I said, like all the like dominant centers of knowledge production in Southeast European studies. But what bothers me the most basically is if we understand Southeast European studies or Eastern European studies as a product basically of Western academia, um, then um, somehow how we bring in the, the, um, uh, the academic traditions of Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe into this conversation. Because at the very moment, it's only in these kind of um, yeah, connections the different universities are having in form of guest research or whatever, uh, joint uh, co uh, collaborative projects or whatever. But um, since there is no such thing as East European history in, I don't know, Moscow or whatever. Um, of course, there is Russian history. So, um, but then we are only then we are, could compare or have a uh, have a look at like the, the the different traditions in history, which would not be very interesting, I guess. So this is something I'm thinking about at the very moment. But I I won't leave it with German speaking academia. So thanks for the question. So I think uh, Michel, uh, you have a question. Um, yes, I do. Um, hi, Elisa. Hi. Um, thanks for your talk, and I hope you know I'm very sympathetic to your project and really excited to hear from the uh, from the ideas you have. I have actually two rather short methodological questions, and the first one is a really simple one. It's just you mentioned that one of your proposed methods would be to have interviews with staff and students from different universities, and I would just wonder what you would like to get out of those interviews and how you would approach them what kind of questions would you ask what kind of perspective you to use to do those interviews and the second one is to um link it back to the um um to parvulescu's um ideas that you used and um her ideas about working without mediators and i was wondering how you intend to 
implement or use those that theorizing into your own into into your own method because on, on face value i would think that you're exactly one of those mediators of course and and and, and your institution as well and i was just honestly just wondering how you would um um implement those ideas into your own methods or how you have already implemented those uh, those ideas thanks yeah thanks a lot for for your question um so regarding the interviews so this um is of course only for for the latest period where we can still find like <laughs> eyewitnesses or uh, um, informants of uh, of this process but what i would like to do is um, really having uh, like a long durée perspective of, uh, of of knowledge production on Southeastern Europe, um, and um, we are so like the very first study programs were implemented at the beginning of the 20th century. And I was wondering how we can track down knowledge transfer, because of course we can have a look at the study programs and um, and all these, I, I hope to find them in the university archives, but we all know that this, what is written in the program and what was what is actually happening in the classroom, there is a huge gap in between. And this is also a broader question for uh, basically higher education studies. And I was asking my colleagues, so do we have any archives on that? How we did, how did we know what, what's happening in the university for the last hundred years? Um, and she's saying, no, we are just starting to think of it also in a historical manner. So um, this is uh, where I, I, I don't know, I have to, start looking at but i was thinking that for these yeah for these transfer processes interviews at least for for the last 50 years would be uh, would be very useful um basically because of course it's always a black box what comes comes <laughs> what what would actually people are then learning out of the of these seminars but um at least um to include students in in these kind of project because usually they are not included because um uh, we are only having this um this view of the of the staff or the professors and um this would be i think very very interesting and i would like i'm i'm not i don't know yet i don't have a program for the interviews that i i'm going to start on this but um i'm very interested in this knowledge transfer so basically um how did the courses look like how were their structures what did they learn what was their perception of eastern europe when they started so um i i I think these kind of questions. <laughs> um, and for the mediators, yeah. So this is, um, you see, I I started this whole project and we were having this conversation. And um, I think uh, Michiel is here and Jacqueline, we are organizing this workshop together. So we are all somehow involved in researching and teaching uh, in Southeastern Europe. And uh, Katerina is here as well. Uh, very happy to see all of you. And um, and I really think it's, it's kind of a collaborative effort and it's also an international effort to do so. So I'm really hoping that we could establish some kind of network to continue with this conversation and this is more about the future curriculum of southeastern european studies look like and that's not up to me um what i can do is only uh, only teach students in my classrooms and i i am very limited as i as i said in my historical courses with, with the undergraduate students um, um but uh, we are facing all these cuttings and we already have only a few bunch of people doing Eastern Southeast European history anyway, and there will be less in the future. So um, I think it's very important to do this study. So that's not, I'm, I don't want to erase it all at all, but I want to start again this conversation, how we can do it in a, in a, in a good way and how we can do it together. And I I was saying what which problems I see at the very moment. So for me, Anka Pavalescu's uh, um, idea of Eastern Europe as a method was just one very, very great idea to, to start with this conversation. So thanks. 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 I mean, I think the, the real challenge for me is always when I'm thinking about this is also how not to, you know, by by having Southeast European studies or East European studies, the risk is always that you you also deprive deprive European studies of this particular part. And I think this is one of the big challenges is, is 
how to re-inject in a certain way the, the knowledge of uh, Southeastern Europe and Eastern Europe, maybe more broadly, into broader narratives of European studies. Because I think this is still the problem. I mean, I talk to colleagues in the US are saying, you know, when people think of European studies, they think of you study Germany, France, the UK, Italy, you know, maybe something exotic like Benelux or Scandinavia, but then Eastern Europe is not part of European studies. That's East European studies. So, so you, you kind of still have this divide reproducing itself in the understanding. And it's kind of like the European one is the attractive one where you get a bestseller. And the East European one is only attractive if you write about the Soviet Union or Russia. Um, uh, and, and that's kind of like, that's it. So I think one has to, I think the question is really how can we uh, also, you know, in a certain way bring in this knowledge into European, I mean, European studies, meaning the study of Europe in whatever discipline or historical period. And I think that's really a challenge because it's still very much perceived as being merely derivative history. I mean, kind of like, you know, you can study nationalism first came in France, and then if you're boring, you can see how it worked out in Serbia or Greece. But like, I mean, I'm being a bit mean here, but I think that's that's a problem of, in, in the way in which uh, I think and we, where, where the risk of doing Southeast European studies, and I'm saying this as a director of a center, is that we actually end up reproducing it by being separate from like mainstream, let's say, uh, uh, discussions. I mean, I think it's just it's just an observation, but I want to bring in Anna Luboy, which has, has a question. So Anna, why don't you go ahead? Yes, thanks. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much for your uh, talk. And uh, uh, actually, I'm, I'm uh, working on a project dealing with history education in Austria and in, in Croatia. Uh, so, but with the whole, like more concentrated on the, like memory studies of a national history and so forth. So it'll be really uh, interesting to, to see your results because I'm also going into the classroom. I did already a bit for Croatia. Uh, so uh, also the, uh, dealing with the few uh, students that are uh, uh, following history tracks. So those uh, start, uh, that are kind of uh, motivated to become history teachers one day. So it will be really nice to see, uh, uh, to, to compare uh, your results with mine and to see how the history of South, Southeast Europe is actually taught and uh, uh, taught about in, in, in uh, in the region and also, for example, in 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 Austria, in other German-speaking country, and uh, with 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 your research on Germany. So, yeah, it would be really nice to 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 have a chat once the project, uh, you know, goes rolls on a little bit more. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, let's stay in contact. And that <laughs> great, and I would be uh, very happy to to hear about what you found out. And also, I think Austria is is different to to at least to Eastern Germany. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you have a, a, a huge minority of, of of people coming from the Balkans, so the interest is very different. So, as I said at the beginning, when I talk about the Balkans, the, the students coming, they don't have any connections. Of course, it's different if you go to 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 like Western Germany and here, uh, Thomas Lava is there doing research on the Gastarbeiters the generation. So there is a different interest too. And I'm facing, as I said, the, the students with families from the former GDR and what they bring with them is this more knowledge about uh, like socialist time in general, but also about Russia. And so they're interested in mainly. Um, uh, and uh, this is something, I don't know how much we have to include this uh, kind of special interest or, or in, 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 our, in, our, in our courses, but I think it's always very helpful to, to start, to make some connections to the students, to offer them a starting point. Mm -hmm discussion because very often I see they come and then they get this like and especially in historical sciences so there are these um, lectures just adding dates for 500 years and they don't see what this has to do with them <laughs> and so I think it's good to think what has to do with them and, mm -hmm. and and we can we have this connection and I also totally agree with what Florian says um, and this discussion goes on for 20 years now how Eastern Europe matters for European history mm -hmm. and we are always saying it's so important come to us and learn something or include it at least and uh, at the end we are always the same 
I don't know, 20, 30 people talking to each other. And this bothers me, this bothers me here in my own institute in department we, where we kind of excluded. And so I think um, this is uh, somehow true what Jörg Barbarowski was saying as this, this mirror appendix because it's a central part of European history. This mm -hmm. is the one thing, but the other thing is that um, I really like the term troublesome knowledge because actually I think it is troublesome knowledge. So I'm now involved in uh, Southeast Asian studies as a student, as a teacher for like 15 years and I learned three different Slavic languages and it's so hard. It's so hard to get familiar with the languages. It is hard to learn the archives. It is hard to get an overview of all this historical um, debates and so um, I think the, this is also very much connected to the Slavic studies which are marginalized all the way and the, uh, the question of language learning so I was talking with Sophia because I would like to start I wanted to start learning Albanian it's not possible to learn Albanian there is no one teaching Albanian so you can uh, learn one one year you can learn both Bosnian Serbian Croatian whatever um, and, and then it is it so this is just an introduction and it, it goes not further so uh, how can we deal with this region and how can we can we uh, yeah teach like this, this history will be in, in, in a part of this discussion if there are no people who are can actually get a good education in some of the regions at least. <laughs> right. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Are there some other questions? I mean, I think the, the, the question is, you know, if we're, if we're, I mean, the, the risk is to say, well, you know, you have to study Southeastern Europe because it's, uh, it's, you know, it's an important part of adding to European history um, and more broadly. But what you said, well, I don't know what you said with troublesome. I mean, is, did you were just referring to language or the difficulty of studying it? Because I mean, there's a risk also of, of, of you know, kind of the risk of, of, of the, I mean, I'm not saying you're doing it, but I'm saying that, that the argument made why it's worth studying Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe is um, its troubles, right? So that like, you know, you kind of end up, you know, I mean, I don't think that you're saying that, but but I think there's there's always the, there's the risk of that argument of saying, well, you know, we, you know, that of how do you make yourself relevant, right, to those debates? And that then as a result, by the ways of making oneself relevant is emphasizing particular historical experiences, which are again, you know, neither representative of the region, but of course, you know, it's easy to convince somebody to say, well, you know, study the region because of the Balkan Wars or, you know, the Yugoslav Wars, but then of course you run the risk of falling into the trap that the region is exclusively seen through the lens of, of, of past conflicts, right? And then and then um, that might make it more on the agenda, but again, in a very uh, reductionist way. No, I don't think, the troublesome knowledge should be like uh, um, the way people to convince people to do to focus on Eastern Europe or South Eastern Europe. But I'm actually I think it's it's a bit tiring that we need to convince people still um, because as we are saying, so we don't have like West European history on the other side, and we basically know. Um, of other area histories, at least in our department, and um, and um, this is why I don't I don't know why we should find arguments at all why it is necessary to study Southeast European history. I just see a different um, development um, if you are looking at the political debates, and this is very much connected to, and somehow it's the same discussion maybe then 100 years ago that the interest in Southeastern Europe or Eastern Europe is always connected to, and then we are coming with this troublesome, to troubles in the region. So may it be or war or budget or whatever is happening. And uh, uh, there is some expert on the region needed explaining why it's that troublesome. And um, now we see that there are only a few of these experts at all. <laughs> and, uh, and I think as long as we are having this vicious circle of there is something politically going on and that's why we need knowledge of the region, we won't come out of this kind of discussion we are having at the very moment. Mm. Right, I mean, I think that's, I mean, let's see if there's anybody else who would like to ask a question because I have, uh, you know, I mean, Anybody would like to chip in here in this debate and give uh, Elisa some also additional suggestions of what could be researched or, or questions or um, so I mean 
of course, one thing you could say it's it's a classical experience of of a region which is experiencing also you know contemporary political marginalization in Europe. So in a certain way, you could say, well, it's the particular positionality is that. I mean, you know, what do you say with languages, right? It's very easy to convince somebody to study Italian or Spanish, and it's not just a function of the size of the language, it's also a function of their so perceived hierarchy of languages, right? So, um, and the same applies, uh, of course, you could say, I mean, the, the problem in Southeastern Europe is that some languages are fairly small. So of course, Albanian seems like a relevant language for, for us to, to, to study potentially, but one which is hardly, uh, you know, kind of gonna make people feel like they're gonna, you know, do much more than, research outside of Albania, right? I mean, but, or, or and, you know, and especially with the non-Slavic languages, it's even more difficult exactly because they're the, the kind of the, the perceived limitation. But but I think it's the hierarchy or the perceived mental hierarchy. I mean, you see this also when you're talking about the students. I mean, you know, we have a, you know, we have a master's in Southeast European studies. So of course our students want to go to Southeast Europe. They come to Graz, but then they want to do their mobility in Zagreb, Sarajevo, Belgrade. But you know the general experience of, of European student mobility is one where students don't want to go to Sarajevo, Zagreb, and Belgrade, but they want to go to London, Paris, and you know whatever Rome or whatever uh, Barcelona and Bilbao, um, and and so I think it, th this is part of the same problem that there's a certain value ascribed to particular regions or, or 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 and not to others, and that makes it much harder to convince that, that this is uh, an attractive, uh, desirable uh, area to study and. And, and I think this is, you know, I mean, we can we can moan it, but bemoan it, but I think it's also just the, the, the factors are well outside of academia or even the conceptualization of the discipline. So in a certain way, we have to, you know, work, I mean, not saying accept it. I mean, I, don't, I think we have to criticize it and, 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 and I think challenge it in many ways, but we also have to realize what are the limitations of what we can do as academics in that field. Uh, Katarina has a question, so I want to bring her in. Katarina, why don't you go ahead and ask the question? Um, hi, and first apologies for coming in late, but I'm also in a conference at the same time, so it's a bit of a <laughs> weird one. Um, thank you very much for the talk, and thank you for the project that I've luckily heard about already. Um, and I have to say that my question comes from a bit, uh, I don't speak or read German, so all of this is, I, although I'm now noticing this uh, East Eastern Europe debate, is it alive or dead in on German Twitter, um, but my... Uh, now when you were speaking my my question and no, nor am i a historian so it's like a double uh, double ignorance on my on my behalf but what i was wondering when you were speaking like is the kind of um in kind of anka parvulescu's language like if we take east europe to be an object of critique in saying like oh it's actually not east european history it's european history but i wonder whether that's also falling short uh from kind of creating a more if you want decolonized account of the region just because if we just frame it as European history, we're losing a lot of these inter-imperial connections that, that we need. So for example, I'm trying to do some research on land politics and to really understand land tenure, you really have to understand Ottoman history, right? not just European history. Um, so I was just wondering whether you have any thoughts on this kind of, what kind of also epistemic violence is done if we only have Europe as a reference point and how can we kind of wrestle away from that reference point, either to the Mediterranean or some other kinds of um, other kinds of regionalisms. But thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot for for coming in and your thoughts. Um, of course, but I think this is basically this is what we are doing at the very moment with comparative history and also if you look at imperial history. So we are having this this entanglements in in our research at least. Um, and uh, I think this is a very it's a good starting point. Um, reflecting on the on the on eastern european history and it's 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 um in, in it's i don't know connection to uh, to 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 politics and all this criticism of of of, of western uh, western hegemony i think this is something we all know by now and we are also taking this as a starting point for global history and all these things you were saying and um but what we don't do is then go back to the to the the question of knowledge transfer and especially back to the to the uh, study programs because of course i can do this but how can i do it if my module is named east european history in 20th century so it's uh, so you know i'm 
I'm, I'm, I'm very limited to do what everyone is doing in research by now. And that's what I would like to start with my, with my project, just um, bring these two different spheres more closely together. The one very advanced discussion about area studies, about Eastern Southeast European studies, uh, and uh, the, 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 the relevance of, of teaching, of classrooms, of study programs. And I think we, we need those. We need those because actually this is where we got our jobs and <laughs> uh, at the one hand on the other hand we need those experts we need someone who's actually learning like ottoman like uh, sofia does or albanian or no serbian or russian so every time uh, we have this give it the Leibniz institute for eastern europe here and uh, they are looking like student um, student staff like every semester and we are really searching for people who are no some basic Russian or any other language. We take mostly everyone because no one's learning Russian at the moment uh, or any other language. So somehow this kind of knowledge is needed, um, uh, but it has to, yeah, we have to bring it somehow together with, uh, with all these uh, discussions we are having in, in researching the region for like 20 years now. And I don't know how to do it because at the other side, we have like this higher education system cutting out all these like small subjects. So um, what's the way to do? And I think the way to do is to think first to work more together. So and I think like Corona is a great starting point because now we are all digitalized and for our small subject, this is so helpful that we can sit here together and have this conversation we wouldn't have otherwise and um, and find common solutions because we are, think we are mostly facing all these problems. And Michiel who was doing his interviews in UK and telling me basically the same is happening there um, with, almost no centers focused on uh, on the region but uh, uh, but uh, yeah facing the same same problems so i think we just we should start <laughs> to do to do this conversation together thanks <laughs> thanks thanks also katarina for your question um i think we're slowly running out of time unless there's any last question um I think we'll have to continue the conversation elsewhere, but I really appreciate Elisa for, for kicking us off. And I think this is exactly the kind of you know debate we need to have. I mean, there is always sometimes worry that there's, and I think German academia has this more than non-German, a bit more navel gazing than it's sometimes useful, but, but it, and you know, there's it's a, it's a tough balance between navel gazing and, and also producing, you know, and I think what you said, you know, how do you communicate this then to students who, you know, who don't want to talk about the definitions of Southeastern Europe over the last 200 years uh, and how they're all wrong and, you know, and, 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 uh, and how, you know, um, while at the same time, you know, so, so how to make the, how to communicate the knowledge in a way which actually is helpful. And I liked your, your quote of saying, you know, it's about this kind of, you know, you know, I think knowledge should make people feel uneasy in a certain way. I mean, you know, raise, ask them questions which they haven't asked themselves before. And I think if we do that, then then we're then then it's not just about having an internal debate about how we should call ourselves and and lamenting our our marginalization in in, in European history or other disciplines, but uh, but but rather making others feel uneasy in a hopefully productive way, which which is I think um, always a good start. Um, so so uh, so we'll I think we'll we'll have definitely a chance and I would like to very much uh, have a conversation with uh, here in Graz as well with our colleagues in the history department um, at the university um, about what you're doing and so we'll see you in Graz uh, hopefully uh, in real life very soon thank you all for coming um, we have uh, we have our nearly ended the semester for our uh, for our program but we're going to have Eli Krasnici who is going to be presenting her research on uh, actually race uh, in southeastern Europe um, and looking at that from a historical perspective um, next week so that will be our last our last uh, Brownberg seminar so um, see you there or elsewhere and have a good summer all the best Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.